Okay, we are going to finish up the chapter, chapter three, physical science connections with uh, talking about two really important topics in earth science, and that is density and buoyancy. I can't stress enough uh, how critical these two things are to so many things that we talk about in earth science, whether it's talking about the forces that drive weather or the forces that drive ocean currents and the reason why we have all the things happen on earth here with temperature density and buoyancy are really really important concepts so density is the amount of mass per given volume in a sub in an object so really two of those things that make up density mass and volume we've actually already talked about so think about again what that means how much mass is in a given volume of an object. So the more mass you have in a given volume, the greater density that you're going to have is. So the book uses these two pictures. So they talk about, let's say you took a real rock and then you put it on a scale and you weighed it and its mass would be 3000 kilograms. Let's say I had a fake rock, if you can believe it. Yes, they make those. I put that on there, it only weighs 10 kilograms. It has a mass of 10 kilograms. So what does that mean? That fake boulder has less mass per volume, same volume, but less mass per volume. So the boulder on the right hand side, the fake one would have a lower density than the real boulder. So this is the formula that we actually use to calculate density. And yes, I say copy it down. Please do that. The formula is important. So density is equal to mass divided by volume. So mass, remember, that's what we measure on the triple beam balance. Mass is measured in grams. Volume is, it depends. So volume, um, whether we're measuring solids, liquids, or gases, and what shape they are, is going to be different. So if I have a cube, I can use things like length times width times height. If I have a liquid, then I can use something like a graduated cylinder and pull it in there. If I'm using a graduated cylinder, then that unit on the bottom down there would be in milliliters. Now you'll notice when I look at the density units on the left-hand side, they are a mass per volume, so gram per cubic centimeters. If I were to measure the volume in milliliters, the units would be in grams per milliliter. So you need to make sure when you are doing these um, that the units are all there and they are what they need to be. So these two things, mass, we've already talked about, so how much matter is inside of an object, remember we measure that in grams. Weight, remember we've also talked about that, weight is a force. So weight is a measure of the pulling force of gravity on mass. So weight, remember we talked about changes when we go to the moon, because you don't have that stronger gravitational pull on the moon, so you weigh less. So make sure we know the difference between those two things. So mass, how much matter is inside of an object, weight, um, a measure of the pulling force of gravity on mass. So weight can change from place to place, but mass stays the same. So weight will change if gravity changes, but mass will not. How much matter is inside something is not going to change. So if your mass on Earth is 45.5 kilograms, your mass on Jupiter is going to be 45.5 kilograms. You guys want to take a guess what happens to gravity on Jupiter? Look at what happens with the weight. So there may be a unit that you've never seen before. It's called the Newton. It's a unit that we use. It's actually the standard unit for weight in the metric system, but we are much more familiar, obviously, with pounds. But 445 newtons on Earth, 1,125 newtons on Jupiter. So whatever you weigh now, you are going to weigh way more on Jupiter because Jupiter has more gravity pulling you down. So mass versus weight on Earth and Jupiter, more gravity on Jupiter, so you're going to weigh more but mass does not change. It stays the same. And volume, remember, is the amount of space that something takes up or how much it contains. So to find the volume of a solid cube or rectangle, we're going to use that length times width times height. So you're going to get out a ruler, length times width times height. Remember, if we're multiplying a centimeter times a centimeter times a centimeter, my units are going to be in centimeters cubed, just like you see in the picture there. So cm with a little three up top. If it's an irregular shaped object, we can use the water displacement method. So let's say we are trying to find the volume of this key. I took the graduated cylinder, I filled it up to 25, dropped the key in, now it reads 28. 
So the difference between those two is three milliliters, and that must be what the volume of the key is. So that's why we call it the water displacement method. You are trying to see how much water it displaces to calculate its volume. So we use that for things that have a weird shape that we can't use a ruler for. The density of a material is always the same uh, under the same conditions. So when we talk about materials, it would be things that are what we call pure substances in matter. So things that are what we call either elements or compounds. So gold, for example, the symbol for gold, the chemical symbol is AU. Gold is always 19.3 grams per milliliter. It doesn't matter if I have a gold bracelet, if I have gold earrings, that's one way for me to know is it actually gold or not. It's always going to be 19.3 grams per milliliter. Hydrogen, look at hydrogen there. That's a gas at room temperature, and I can even see that from the density measurement, 0 0.089 grams per milliliter. That's a really, really low number. So because it's a low number, it tells me it has less mass per volume in which gases do. They have less molecules in a given volume. Silver, its chemical symbol is AG, 10.5 grams per milliliter. So silver, if you were holding silver and gold in your hands and they were the same size, the gold should feel heavier to you, about twice as heavy as the silver does because it has about twice as much mass per the same volume as silver does. But those things are characteristic properties. So what it means is they're not ever going to change. When you do the math, the mass divided by volume, it's always going to be what it is for those. So we can actually use density to identify materials. When you think about fool's gold, which is the mineral pyrite, if someone thought that they had gold, all you have to do is calculate the density of it because pyrite, fool's gold, and real gold do not have the same density. So if I were to look at a steel cube, so here we have a steel cube, it's mass, let's say it's 7.8 grams and its volume is one cubic centimeter. And I have a nail, mass of 12.5 grams, volume of 1.6. So if I calculate the density, mass divided by volume, so for the cube, 7.8 grams divided by one cubic centimeter, there is its density, 7.8 grams per cubic centimeter. Now if I do the nail, mass of the nail, 12.5 grams, Volume of the nail, 1.6 cubic centimeters. What do you think is going to happen if they're both made of steel? Same exact number. So the math will always work out because density is a characteristic property and it is not going to change. The second thing this section talks about is what we call the buoyant force. And if you have ever gone swimming before, you have felt the buoyant force acting on you. You even feel it when you are in the bathtub at home if you are taking a bath. So when you are in water or in any object, as in we'll use water as an example first because we're so familiar with it, if you feel like that water is pushing up on you, it is. It actually is. And that is what the buoyant force is called. The buoyant force is the force of that fluid pushing up on you. If you've ever seen a balloon floating before, so now we're talking about not in water, we're talking about in air. That balloon is floating because air is pushing back up on the balloon, so it's moving up. So the book uses this example of, let's say we have a 400 cubic centimeter rock, and we know that it has sunk to the bottom of a pond, as most rocks are going to do. That rock is going to displace, and when I say displace, guys, it's pushing it aside. That's just another fancy way of saying pushing it aside. So 400 cubic centimeters is pushing it aside. It's going to displace the same volume of water, right? If I'm a 400 cubic centimeter rock, I'm going to push aside 400 cubic centimeters of water. So when the rock is completely underwater, it displaces or pushes aside an amount of water that's equal to its volume, right? Makes sense. It wouldn't be any different. It's going to push aside its size. So when you think about what we were just talking about with density, which has its molecules more tightly packed together, the rock or the water? Did you say the rock because it's a solid? You were correct. It is the rock. So on Earth, objects exert an upward buoyant force equal to their weight. So if we look at the rock, which we just said was 400 cubic centimeters, it has a force of 9.8 newtons, if we're going to convert that into a weight. Remember, we like to use newtons in science because it's a metric measurement that we use. Now, 400 cubic centimeters of water, on the other hand, that that rock pushed aside has a force of 3.9 newtons for a weight. So now think about comparing those two numbers there. 
I'm comparing 9.8 newtons pushing and 3.9. Which one's bigger? The 9.8 is bigger, right? So the rock is going to have a greater buoyant force on Earth. So when I think about now, look at the, especially the picture, picture on the right-hand side, the rock's pushing down with 9.8 newtons, and the water's pushing back up with 3.9. So what's going to win out? The greater force will always win out in nature. So because 9.8 newtons is larger than 3.9 newtons, that rock is going to sink. So really what it's getting into when you talk about the buoyant force is when we start talking about why certain things sink and why other things float, it really all has to do with the buoyant force. So when the rock is dropped into the water, the water's buoyant force is not enough to support it. The rock sinks because its weight is greater than the weight of the displaced water. So things actually sink because their weight is greater than the weight of the displaced water water. If you want something to float, I have to make the weight of the displaced water larger. So things sink because their weight is greater than the weight of the displaced water. A new topic that we really haven't talked about, but it has to do with this whole buoyant force are fluids. And it's the last thing that your book talks about. Fluid is any matter that can flow. So think about different states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, and think about matter that can flow. Can solids flow? No. Can gases flow? Yes. Can liquids flow? Yes. So gases and liquids are both Fluid. So fluid does not mean the same thing as liquid. So liquids and gases are called fluids. So when objects are in fluids, the buoyant force can be acting on them to push them up. So where is the buoyant force acting on each object? So think about the boat sitting in the water. Where is the buoyant force? If the boat is floating, you know that the force, the buoyant force of the water pushing underneath it must be greater because it's floating. So the buoyant force for the boat would be the water pushing up. The balloon is also floating. So that tells me that the buoyant force pushing up is greater than the buoyant force pushing down. If I look at those two liquids, the oil and the vinegar, the vinegar has a buoyant force pushing up on the oil and that's why it's still staying there. So kind of a weird concept to really start to get into real depth about why certain things float and why certain things sink, but it really has to do all with this. I'm just going to come back to this slide here. It has to do with the buoyant force. If this number on the bottom, if we can figure out a way for that 3.9 to become a bigger number than 9.8, we would have this float. You could have the rock float. And can you make a rock float? Yeah, you can make a rock float. Think about what you can do. You're going to put it on something that is going to change the buoyant force pushing up on it. Think about putting it on a raft, um, a big inflatable air mattress in the water. You are now changing the buoyant force of the water pushing up on it and it will float. All right, so density is mass per volume, mass per volume, mass divided by volume, and the buoyant force is when something is in a fluid, it is what is pushing up on it.